All right, here we go. Picking up, picking up where I left off. Sugarfoot. Uh, Sugarfoot was a good band. I learned how to deal with agents, bookkeeping, successful business. Um, end of operating a band in general. Eventually, all this would would one day become helpful. During Sugarfoot's heyday, the greatest moment of my life occurred: the birth of my second son, Keith. Georgie's water broke one night in April while she was at a gig listening to the band. We went to the hospital around midnight. You know, I, I don't know if I've ever actually read this or heard this before, so this is enlightening to me. Went to the hospital around midnight. No one was there, no doctor, no staff. It took some time to round up the crew for the special event. Georgie was in and out of labor most of the night. I walked around the hospital in my blue scrubs with paper covers on my shoes, waiting to see my new son come into the world. At one point, I was looking around in places where I shouldn't have been. This is pretty typical of my dad and a bad habit I picked up from him. Is this just like, you know, going into things that are roped off and being, you know, little to no respect for employees only signs. Um, just, it's gotten me into a lot of trouble over the years. I don't, under, I don't understand why he taught me that this was appropriate, but this like wandering into areas you're not supposed to be in. Probably just... You know, that's where the fun is at, right? All right, so at one point I was looking around at places where I shouldn't have been. I found a horizontal freezer. At least that's what it looked like. Taking a peek inside, I was shocked to find plastic containers with placentas and umbilical cords waiting for who knows what. Slamming the lid closed, I left the exploring the maternity ward to those authorized. <laughs> Why, dude? What were you looking for, ice cream? What do you think was going to be in there? Uh, Keith came into the world around 8 in the morning with a purple color. I had no idea if it was normal. The few seconds before he took his first breath seemed like forever. He breathed and so did I. The first thing I did when check all his fingers and toes, I ha heard every new parent does that. He brought this up to me over and over again about checking my fingers and toes. It was not a concern when I had my kids. Just to make sure he's a normal kid. Just because you got fingers and toes doesn't mean you're normal, Dad. It was like Christmas Day every day after that. I was so happy to be a dad. We named him Keith after Keith Emerson, my keyboard hero. He was cons We had considered naming him Wolf, as in Wolfgang, but we already had a tiger and a zoo is not in the works for this family, with already too much drama. Not long after the birth, I said to Georgie, let's have another one. Of course, as most women who have just gone through eight months of labor, she looked at me as though I were crazy and demanded, are you fucking kidding? This is the last. It was. That sounds like my mother. Are you fucking crazy? All right. One week after Keith was born, Sugarfoot hit the road along with our whole family. The wife, two kids, a week old baby, and Fred the cat. My dad used to talk. My dad and mom used to always talk about being on the road a week after I was born. Not something I would have done with a new newborn baby, but, but um, you know, different people, different times, different standards. Fred was a pure white Persian cat we had gotten for free at the vet. His previous owners had left him there, probably because of his bad disposition. He was not a nice cat and would have would bite you if you looked at him wrong. The only time he was friendly was when he was riding in the van on road trips. He went everywhere with me. Our trips became a four-month working vacation with the family. When we started out, people thought we were crazy taking a week-old baby. Our travels would take us to Topeka, Medford, Oregon, Chico, California, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and St. Louis, Missouri. We traveled in three vans, John and Donna in one, and Chris and his wife, Joanne, we called her Doug, in the second. She was our lighting man, I mean woman. We followed in the last van. It was fun and games through most of it, with the exception of the typical truck breakdowns. On a day off during our two-week stay in Albuquerque, we decided to visit a place called Hemis Hot Springs in the mountains of New Mexico. We left early Sunday. I'm not sure why he brought the cat Fred up. Maybe maybe he'll come back to that, but Fred was not a very good pet. I mean, we buried him alive on accident because we thought he was dead once, and he, like, dug his way back out. I mean, the kid, the cat was just, like, a terror, and he was not a friendly cat. All right. After a long drive to the mountains and asking for directions along the way, we finally found a beautiful spot. The trail toward the hot springs was down a deep path and a creek and then up the other side. Georgie, carrying Keith in his infant seat, was dressed in a bikini and flip-flops, not ideal hiking attire. 
As we got to the bottom of the hill, we could see that being springtime, the stream had become an overflowing river. Attempting to cross on logs and debris, Georgie fell into the water, still holding Keith's seat. I turned and screamed with horror as I saw in my mind's eye the baby toppling out of the sea into the river and floating downstream, never to be found. Instead, up to her armpits in icy cold water, she managed to hold the baby over her head, saving both Keith and the car seat. Once on the other side of the stream, Lisa and Tiger ran ahead, eager to see the much-talked-about hot springs. Oh my God. My life should have ended on so many occasions before I made it this far. It's just all, it's all bonus right now. Slowly making our way up the, up the mountain, we found the spot, and it was not what we had managed, imagined. It was a hippie hangout with a small pool of water in the middle of a few boulders. Crowded in the pool, there were about 10 or 12 naked souls washing their hair and smoking joints. This was not a family resort for small children. Yeah, no shit. By the time Georgie and I arrived, Lisa and Tiger had already jumped in the middle of the festivities. What the hell? There didn't seem to be any point making a big deal about how weird it all was, and my kids were very hip anyways and probably had seen worse at home. I'm not even sure what to say to all that. Like he's told this story a million times in front of me about Tiger and and Lisa jumping into the middle of all these naked hippies smoking weed in some hot springs. Um, seeing worse at home. I mean, I saw some weird shit at home, but I didn't see anything quite that outrageous. No orgies or anything. But uh, I'm not sure what the point of this story is, other than um, a crazy thing that happened one time. On the last leg of our tour with only two weeks to go, we arrived in St. Louis. Betty, Georgie's mother, had flown in from Kansas City to hang out with the band, somehow forgot to bring what she needed in the way of clothes. I ended up loaning her some money for a new St. Louis wardrobe. All went well. By now, we were looking forward to getting home after three months on the road. Keith had seen more in the first three months than I had had by the time I was 20. Too bad he wouldn't remember it. No, I mean, of course I don't remember it. it was, my brain wasn't fully formed yet. On the last night, as we were packing up the vans and moving all the kids, equipment and clothes for travel, it started to rain. Parked in the front of the hotel, Fred the Cat was scratching under the driver's seat. This was his signal he had to be let out to pee. The rain came harder, and I was in a hurry to get back in the KC after a four-month trip. This is, he just left the cat behind. I'm not sure why he's telling this story. Driving west on I-70, I made a mental tally of my passengers, and wait a minute, where's the cat? I noticed Fred was cat. Fred was not had not come forward to sit on my lap. My lap was Fred's spot when we were traveling. The only time he was nice. I pulled over to the side of the highway and stopped looking at the little looking for the little white shit. Opened the side door and started pulling things out of the van. Betty's suitcase, a small amp, a few more boxes. Even looked at the Leslie, the big organ speaker where Fred sometimes slept when he wasn't in my lap. But then I was too tired and increasingly impatient, impatient to get home. The hell with it. He's in there somewhere. We finally arrived in Kansas City. Still no Fred. Georgie was not too happy about me losing the cat. Dropping Betty off of that. This is the thing. My mom loves animals. And, like, the thought of mistreating them or abusing them or abandoning them is just... She just wouldn't stand for it. We had a dog named Lady around this... A couple years after this, probably. But it was, like, a great stray that we had. And my dad told me a story one time where he... He didn't care for the dog. She was like shitting on the carpet or something. But he drove her out to the middle of nowhere and then just dropped her off in the woods and then got back in the van and started driving away. And the, and the dog started chasing after him. And um, he just, he said, you know, I think he thought he was displaying some sort of empathy or whatever. But he ended up, you know, giving in and couldn't do it and pulled over and let the dog get back in the van to bring her home. But, and Lady lived with us for a long time, and, and my mom and I, I remember when she died when I was, you know, 10 or around that age. But my dad tells, told that story to me thinking it was like some example of empathy that he had had. And, you know, in my mind, it was just another example of, here's a really shitty thing I did, um, and I'm a better person because I didn't go through with it. It's like that Rodney Dangerfield joke, like I saved a woman from being raped today, I changed my mind. But he meant it. Like it was. There's a lot of those kinds of stories, you know, that he told me as his son. And so it makes me think. Like how many of these stories where he had some just absolutely terrible shit thing that he did, 
where he didn't tell me the story and just went about his way and was too ashamed to ever admit to whatever it is he had, you know, whatever situation he had put himself in. Um, he generally only admitted fault if he got caught. So, I digress. Here we go. Uh, Dropping off Betty at the house, I realized I had forgotten her suitcase now lying somewhere along the side of road I-70. Guess I couldn't now ask for payment, repayment on loan for her new clothes. All right, so then he left her clothes on the side of the road. We called the hotel to ask the day to ask to see if anyone's seen a white cat hanging out. Yes, we were informed that a pretty white Persian was prancing in the lobby like he owned the place. That would be Fred. We asked if they would keep an eye on him until we got came back to get him. They gave him his own room and fed him ham sandwiches. I mean, pretty cool for the cat, I guess. The next weekend, Georgie and I, Georgie and a friend returned to St. Louis and retrieved him. That cat had more than nine lives. Yeah, but you know, this is also typical where like he fucked up and then he sends someone else to like fix the problem for him. Which maybe it made sense, but still kind of shitty. Before long, I was fired from Sugarfoot. Gee, maybe drinking might have had something to do with it, do you think? I started it. I love how he just completely glosses over getting terminated from probably the most successful band he was ever in. Like, it doesn't, like, it just was like another footnote in his long line of, like, missed opportunities. You know, Sugarfoot didn't go on anything big. I don't know what happened to Chris or any of those other guys. Um, but. I think they all just were like local musicians in Kansas City, but like the fact that my dad sums up what was probably an incredibly traumatic and terribly dramatic situation with uh, I shouldn't have drank so much is kind of lame. It doesn't make for very good storytelling. So let me tell you what probably happened. He got drunk, made a joke he thought was funny, um, but was really insulting to somebody, and then doubled down on it when he was confronted, and then refused to back down. Um when he knew he was wrong and then uh, he gets to blame drinking for it 40 years later alright I started a new band legend I was lucky to have a good agent and some high paying gigs we worked some hotels in Kansas City and did a little road travel so he did have uh, an agent at one point which you know that's a good thing but he probably didn't have much respect or understanding what agents really do the lineup started slow with a few changes, but ended up with Robin on bass, Greg on guitar, and Jimmy on drums. Robin was a tall, red-headed guy who looked like Luke Spencer on General Hospital. Good singer, but always sang in keys a little too high for his voice. I liked Robin. He and I hung out quite a bit as we both liked to smoke that wacky weed. Greg was Robin's friend. He came into the band with a country influence, a great picker, and a good voice for stuff like Springsteen. He had a great talent. Like, we don't give a shit about these random dudes that you were in a band with, right? Um, he would call me his son, me son. Uh, he was a tall, bald man with a big heart. All right. Jimmy was my family. He was best friend for years. We would sit outside the hotel after work for hours drinking and talking, much to the dismay of our wives. Getting home at the crack of dawn after an all-night rap session was common. Jimmy was a great drummer and singer. He had his wife, Annie, became a good friend of our family. Juju and I sometimes spent holidays with him. Good thing everyone sang because I still didn't. This is like, his not singing is clearly a regret of his, at this point, writing the book. And I remember Jimmy and Annie and their son, uh, God, I can't remember the kid's name, but we were pretty close there for years. You know, five, six years old, I remember hanging out with a kid. I remember uh, making, like, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on their house's uh, counters, teaching their son how to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And he got in trouble because Annie, I guess, was some sort of control freak and wouldn't let him do anything. Um, but I was, like, you know, baking cakes by the time I was six and seven. So, whatever. Okay, we were very lucky to get a job at the Score Lounge at the Holiday Inn across the street from the Royal Stadium. I remember this gig. We played there Monday through Thursday, which gave us a weekend to play other rooms and private parties. This went on for three years, so we did have it good. In fact, we no longer needed an agent. <laughs> oh, that's where you're fucking wrong. We were set, having this great spot during the week and the weekends to make some real money. During the holidays, we played Christmas parties for even larger, larger cash. You know, that would have been the opportunity to record some albums and write some music and then, and then really make a push for some, some like, scalable success. 
but they didn't do it. They didn't do what you got to do as a musician, which is put out content. I love baseball. Great. I didn't. Never did. Now, I love baseball. Being across from the stadium gave me a good chance to go to most home games in the spring and summer months. Many of the players would hang out in the score after the game, so we knew some of them, and I loved it. I would, of course, take my glove to the games. One Friday night, I went early. During practic- pra- batting practice, I caught a couple balls, and I was on a hot streak. Beer and reefers were commonplace in the right field bleachers back then. We were known as the right field rowdies. The Toronto Blue Jays were in town, and by the time the game was in full swing, I was flying. Right, so he's smoking and drinking at the at the baseball game. And I'm going to take a pause there.